So the topic of our panel is predictions for portfolios and the role of robo-advisors. Um, my name is Monique Miller. I'm a trustee here at IPAM. And I also work at Wilshire Associates. And Wilshire is um, kind of an interesting organization. The, the firm was founded back in the 1970s as a analytics and risk management firm. And I'm sure you can all imagine that analytics and risk management was very different in 1970 than it is today. Um, the firm has a big institutional consulting business. Um, I'm on the asset management business where I head up strategy for our alternatives. Cleo? Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cleo Chain. Um, I, um, my primary role uh, is to lead the alternative investment efforts at American Century Investments, which is a asset management firm based in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, prior to that, I spent uh, about a decade at Wilshire Associates really leading the investment efforts there. Uh, good morning, I'm Tina Singh. I am, um, I guess I'm a serial entrepreneur and uh, in the asset management business and along with the working both at UBS and Merrill Lynch on the investment banking side, left there to start my own companies and I'm just started my third one. So. Hello, good morning, my name is Jia. I am a partner at First Quadrant. First Quadrant is a, a boutique uh, management firm in Pasadena. We manage about 23 billion of our clients. We um, manage asset um, global macro and equities and I oversee our equity business. And in our investment process, we uh, apply scientific um, discipline to our investment process with some amount of uh, discretion. So our investment style is appropriate, it's relevant to our topic of discussion today. Um, as, as much as we believe in uh, you know, a systematic approach to investment, we don't believe in autopilot and we, we, we believe uh, with the involvement of human, um, uh, understand the uh, strengths and weaknesses or models and how best to apply them is important for investment success. Thank you. So um, the topic today is predictions for portfolios and the role of robo-advisors. Um, who in the room does not know what a robo-advisor is? All right, so we, we have a couple. Um, and who in the room uses a robo-advisor? Does anyone in the room use? Okay, so we have a couple people with kind of hands-on experience, which is good. Um, so Tina, do yeah. you want to take us through kind of what a robo-advisor is, a little bit about the history, how they work? So a robo-advisor, when you think about the asset management business, and you know I've been in it for almost 25 years, dare I say, um, it's like the archaic dark ages, you know, in terms of technology. So what I think is interesting about the robo-advisor, it's the first step where it's really sort of addressing um, the world that we really live in, which is digital and is, you know, um, really not tied to a desk. So what I think is interesting about it, and, and basically what it is, is it's, an, it's a digital first algorithmic, uh, algorithmic can't even speak right now. Yeah. Thank you. You know what I mean. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, themed investment uh, advisor. So, and it usually generally uses uh, ETFs so that it's a lower cost model to using what's available at the, at the traditional uh, national broker dealers. So it's, and it's generally available on your mobile device as well as web-based. So it, it's a completely different type of approach to investing than more traditional investing, which is uh, human-based. There's some, there might be some fundamental portion to it, but generally there's humans making the portfolio decisions. So I can think about some benefits, right? Certainly ease of use and, um, you know, using technology and probably less expensive than kind of old school asset managers. but. Um, I'd love to hear from the panel what we think sort of the risks or, or drawbacks of, of robos might be. Cleo, you want to start us off? Sure. You know, I, I think with what you heard um, in, in the last panel, you know, we, we want sort of computational and other technology to enable us to analyze 
and sort of process more information. But I think as Josh said in, in her introduction of what her firm does is, I think a lot of people, human beings, the, the way our brain thinks, we're afraid to completely hand over 100% of decision making to a, a, a robot. So I think that's where the decision, like, like Tesla, right, auto, auto drive driverless cars, there's always a default option to bring control back to us, the humans. So I think that is where um, I think there's further development. Uh, there's probably going to be a, a group of people who says, I trust in algorithm, I trust them to be emotionless, and they will always make the systematic decision for me. But then I, I, at least with the people that I interact with, my perception is more people wants to have some um, sort of introduction of human um, interpretation of information and decision making in that whole process. Yeah, and I guess one of the things is it's not really been tested in a down market. So robo-advisors have generally been, uh, as they start to sort of gain popularity, um, most of the assets have been in a rising market. And so you haven't really seen uh, a downturn. And so I think one of the challenges is going to be, and Clee and I were just talking about this outside, you know, upside joy is like one to three to downside pain. So no one's really seen downside pain yet. And so when what's going to happen when you start to see things go really against you and it's going to be quick and so i guess that's one of my real my concerns is going to be you know we get a lot of money in there and then all of a sudden things start to go the wrong way so um i'm excited about robo advisor um i, I think it democratized the uh, financial advisory industry it actually um put you know control to take have in, individ, in, empower individuals to take control of, of their financial futures. Um, however, the robo advisor services they they are operating on the assumption that um, asset owners have a fairly clear understanding of their own financial circumstances, their risk preference, and uh, you know they have fundamental uh, understanding of investment concepts. The they um, well, they understand the potential risk and rewards of investment products, the 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 the, um, the, the full range of implication of their own decisions. But in reality, we actually have seen a fairly widespread of financial illiteracy. And you know, you look at many households. Actually, they have very limited understanding of basic economic concepts. That um, that is needed to make sound investment decisions, and that on the top of that, we also there is survey data also uh, show that you know not only do in investors have lack of financial knowledge, they also have um, more confidence in their financial ability than than justify. So there's there is survey data. I mean, I remember there's there's survey about 10 years ago by Com Commerce Med Bank in Germany. And um, among the respondents, about 80% of them feel like they're very confident in their own ability to understand financial issues. <laughs> While the same amount of people, only a little bit over 40%, were able to ans answer the survey question correctly. And we see the same kind of you know, results in many countries, um, such including U.S. And so, so if you actually combine the lack of financial knowledge and um, the overconfidence, the oh, robo advisor. One of the benefit of robo advisor is is you know, people are able to make in investment decisions, asset allocation decisions, with a click of a few buttons. And so the availability may not be all positive, right? And so uh, I, I think um, a good balance should be struck between the, um, you know, the efficiency of decision making and the quality of decision making. And the other thing is that um, robo advisors, I think they have a general objective of improving e efficiency. That means that it requires simplification. And some investment-related issues are not as 
easy to simplify. And so, so there's some complexity relates to investment. And so th there's another balance to, to need to be strike between simplicity and, you know, providing the right solution that address invest in, can, investment. Can I, I, I wanted to add on to that because I, I think you're right exactly uh, in the way that, the way that I look at them now um, is they've been really sort of organized more as savings tools but not necessarily focused on the investment outcome. And so, you know, um, I'm actually working with Walsher. I've just built a new robo-advisor that's actually gonna have Walsher pick the portfolios. And the idea is, let's give you real investment opportunity along with the ease of use. So, because I think I felt a lot of them right now, are, they're, they're fantastic, but they're really designed to help you start to a savings program or some sort of investment program, but not really focused on what the outcome is. Yeah, what we have seen a lot is the robo-advisor, because it's so accessible mm -hmm. on your phone, right? Every day it can pop an alert or like a daily reminder for you to do something versus the more traditional financial advisor path. You may talk to this person twice a year, maybe once a year. So it's been a tool, I think we've seen more adoption in uh, creating new behavior patterns, right. right? Like people usually, you know, in the past people think about 401k maybe once or twice a year, maybe once during the new year resolution. <laughs> and then the second time during tax, tax season. Tax yeah. season. <laughs> right, so I think what we're seeing is a, a lot of the robo technology yeah. is being used to trigger and introduce new behavior patterns and more, I think, to what Tina was saying, more in the, because if you, you can't invest if you don't save, right? Like you have no money to invest. So like triggering that phase one of allowing you to actually invest is to create the savings pattern. Once we have that down, then I yeah. think as technology mature and we go through full market cycles of up and down markets, people can start to develop at what we think are more practical robo advisor platforms than I think where the industry is probably at today. And do you think, because of the ease of a robo-advisor, that more people will save? You know, I mean, you talked about kind of financial illiteracy, right? And I don't know if that's generational or just widespread here in the U.S. and you mentioned across countries, but will more people save and kind of stick with their investment, stick with their plan as a result of having this kind of functionality? I guess that's more a prediction because we don't know. Um, I, I think changing behavior, we're seeing some traction in that already, right? People log into their account, you know, like, you know, uh, when you buy a cup of coffee, you put whatever the change to round up to the next dollar into yeah. your savings plan. So it's sort of a painless way of creating savings. So we're seeing traction with that. Um, but I think what will be more more difficult is as people start to accumulate savings, that the urge to fight off instant gratification, right? Because that has been the thing that's been hampering the US consumers a lot, is when they see that sort of savings account start to grow, there's something they want to buy. It's a kayak, it's a new bike, it's something else, it's something else. So, you know, one of the things for us in the traditional financial advisory world, we always tell our clients, and do, don't look at your account value every day. Don't, don't worry about whether the market is up 3% or down 4% today because that just triggers sort of knee-jerk reaction, which oftentimes are bad. You know, to Tina's yeah. point, when, when your account's up 3%, it feels good, but when it's down 3%, it feels terrible. There's that asymmetry in emotional reaction. So part of robo having more access to information all the time may actually cause people to behave in a way that we know from historical studies could actually lead to bad decisions. So I think, you know, sort of it can't help certain behaviors, but could actually cause sort of bad yeah. reactions. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I would say is anything, any tool that helps people start savings, to me is good. Because when you look at the US, you know, I, I'm from the UK and I, you know, we save. <laughs> you know, it's like, you save 20% of your earnings. It's just like, it's what you do. So when you come to the U.S., no one saves. So I, I find it so interesting that it took a, an app to get people to start saving. But if it works, it works. I'm like, I'm for it. You yeah. Know? yeah. 
Absolutely. I'm but, just wondering, um, oh. since people, I mean, the, a lot of, uh, you know, the research show that people are uh, inertia, right? I mean, so, so the default setting is very important. Yes. Perhaps we can set a default setting in RoboAdvisor to uh, discourage knee-jerk reaction, as Cleo was saying, you know, when there's a you know, decline in asset value, um, if there's a, a higher hurdle for people to react, perhaps there's something that can be done in the design of RoboAdvisor. Great. Yeah. So um, I think Tanya, in her opening remarks, talked a little about the move to passive investing. So going from sort of active managers um, making investment decisions more to investment options that are passive, that are rules-based. Um, and you know, according to a, a Bank of America study, over $1 trillion um, here in the U.S. has moved to passive investment since 2009. So if you look at a chart, like the trend is just, it's amazing. And I'd love to hear from the panel, um, firstly, like is robo-advisors, how much of a, a genesis is robo-advisors to this trend or are there um, kind of other impetus to, to kind of this move to passive investing? Yeah. I will defer on this question just because I personally haven't had the direct experience working with robots, um, but where I do see part of the catalyst that I believe is causing part of this shift is the, the overall pressure on lowering fees, lowering cost for individuals, uh, investors like ourselves to obtain both financial advice and the cost of these financial vehicles that we purchase, whether it's ETFs or mutual funds or whatever of your choice. So when there's that overall pressure on fees, something has to give. And it has been for nine years that passive investments have put up very respectable performance. Uh, but you know, we, we can go through a debate as to how much that has been the market environment. Yeah, but I think in, in at least, you know, people have short memories, you know, a lot of people don't remember how bad 2008 is anymore. We have selective memory. So I think, you know, people think, oh, this has worked out good. You know, I'm saving almost 70 cents, you know, sort of 70 basis point a year when I compound that, it makes a difference. The financial advisor is telling them this is the right thing. And, and to just point, people really don't have very good financial literacy uh, in this country. So I think a lot of those factors may have culminated as part of the reason it's driven up the passive investing. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I think uh, the market's been one of the main culprits because when you have an S&P that's continuing to outpace managed money, um, you know, people sort of say, well, that's just going to be, that's a pattern. So that's not really a pattern. It just happens to be the pattern that's going on right now. Like what you'll see is that there'll be opportunities and times when uh, managed money will outpace uh, the index. But right now, the index is outpacing managed money. So I think you need to have a combination in your portfolio. And I do think that the, um, I think if you're a financial advisor, you need to look at the robos because the robos are taking, uh, are providing a more efficient vehicle for some of your core and beta driven strategies. So I think that's where you use your robo, you use it for the core and beta driven. There's always gonna be opportunities for advisors to provide specialized products and specialized advice. But for this type of product, that's why I think you're seeing such a huge, and you're gonna to continue to see that in beta driven strategies. You, know, you don't need to pay 1% for an S&P replication product, so. That's right. I think uh, the impact of robo-advisor uh, on financial advisory industry is similar to the impact of passive investing on, on the asset management industry. And, and uh, robo-advisor likely a user of passive products and, and active products. So um, I agree with Clear about the fees pressure. Um, the, the other thing is that I, I, I think it's likely it's going to accelerate the convergence uh, between passive and active to get longer term equilibrium. Well, you know, if you ask people here, I, I bet everybody's going to give you a slight, slightly different ratio. But, you know, one thing we know is that uh, it's not going to be 100% passive, right? 
mean, I think it's uh, in order for the market to to be able to allocate their resources effect effectively and efficiently, we need uh, a group of people who uh, provide this price discovery services and, and active managers are, uh, are there to provide the service. Yeah, and um, you know, this move to passive investments is huge and it's across the scope of all investors. We see the smallest retail investor using robo-advisors moving to passive as well as the largest institutions, the largest pension plans. And, um, you know, I quite agree. Like, there, there's got to be some sort of combination between active and passive. But is this move to passive generally good for portfolios, or is it the next financial crisis? Is it the next um, source of illiquidity in the markets or, or problems? Um, any thoughts there? Um, I don't know, but I, I think I still remember the 2007 <coughs> sort of downturn for, for quantitative strategies. And I think that the, one of the questions uh, for the previous panel sort of touched on this is, you know, are there, is everyone taking the same bet? You know, so, yeah. so I think in 2007, the immediate aftermath, I, I think a, people didn't quite figure out what caused all the quant managers to go down significantly everybody had like a six seven eight nine standard deviation event all within a few days of each other sort of within the same time frame so you know when we start to peel back it did seem like a lot of the trigger was that a lot of the quantitative shops all were betting betting on uh, marginally different but at the end of the day same factors in the marketplace so i think as passive continue uh, continue to grow in its dominance um we could potentially find ourselves in these, you know, in these things because quantitative strategies tend to be so uh, frequently rebalanced and traded. Um, unlike fundamental managers, everyone can sort of hop on the same trend, but it takes longer to, to play out. For quantitative managers, because everyone is largely always rebalancing your portfolio, <coughs> th these things can sort of pile on top of each other much more quickly and create an, an abrupt event in a market like we saw in 2007. So. And they actually got whipsawed, if I remember correctly, they because they, they, they rolled together on the way down and then yeah. they yep. bang back down again. So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. It's definitely, we haven't seen what happens in an aggressive market. And um, it's understandable that the triggers are all going to be kind of around the same area. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I do think it's going to continue, by the way. You asked. Yeah. That was the first part of your question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. I think it's just the beginning. So, Monique, when you uh, uh, talk about passive, you include factor investing? Well, yeah, that's another um, interesting area of passive investing. So, I'd, I'd yeah. love to get your thoughts there. So, uh, I think uh, the investment process is reflexive in nature. So, uh, the performance characteristics of factors and style is going to change if more and more people invest in them, in them right? So, so if you see uh, factor invest, investment becomes much more popular and more and more investors. So give us an example, just because I'm not sure um, in terms of the audience, kind of their um, familiarity with factor-based investing. So okay, give us an so example of what yeah, that might look like. Factor-based investor, um, factor-based investing, um, for example, you invest in uh, a group of stocks that tilt towards the value um, or tilt towards price momentum. Um, and that's the type of factor investing people are talking about. And so those have, a, I mean, there's a lot of uh, literatures out there showing that the, the, the tilt towards certain type of characteristics have uh, can generate better risk adjusted return compared to uh, uh, market indexes. And so um, it's becoming more and more popular in the market. In fact, in our process, we, we use many of the factor ideas. Um, and and as, as I mentioned earlier that, but the investment process is reflexive in ma nature. As more and more people getting into the factor investing, that itself is gonna change the characteristic of factor performance. And as, as you see more, more factors becoming uh, taking more of a risk budget in investor portfolios, investors going to treat the factors as part of risk uh, portfolio, right? 
So so factors may perform more and more like a traditional risk uh, risk asset. They would um, possibly subject to periodical swings of in investor sentiment. They could become more cyclical. Uh, so so for example, during market stress, a lot of times investors would dump their risky assets. Well, in, the, in, in this case, if their risky assets include factors, well, they could dump the factors too. And then also, you know, in, in, in um, during market recovery, they will want to buy risky assets, then they will buy the factor suit. And what you see is the factor become more cyclical. And so the diversification benefits that provide, provided by those uh, commoditized factors would reduce over time. And so, on, on the other hand, I think the ability to dynamically adjust exposure to factors will become variable. Right. Um, you know, we see that too. You know, you, you invest in a portfolio of, say, low vol stocks, right? And because there's so many products based on low vol stocks, guess what? They're not low vol anymore, right? So, yes. um, so it, it's it's I think a very interesting trend and. Um, when we think about factor-based investing, um, it really does range in complexity, right? So you can have a Gia's initial example, um, you know, maybe a stock portfolio tilted towards more value stocks up to what we like to call risk premium investing, which can be pretty sophisticated alternative strategies that use leverage, that um, are long short, uh, that are you know global, but quantitative and rules driven. Um, so I'm interested, Cleo, like who do you see using these more sophisticated risk premium strategies? How do investors use them, um, and you know, in their portfolios and asset allocation? Yeah. You know, I, I think we, we're still probably seeing the more sophisticated segment of the investors adopting be the early adopters of these risk premium strategies. I think one of the one of the stats I hear is, you know, Americans in general spend 200%, uh, 200 times more of their free time thinking about their annual vacation than their financial investment portfolio. And of the people I know, it's probably true, right? You debate like which Disney cruise, where to depart, <laughs> is it a five day, seven day? And, and people, maybe it's because of lack of financial literacy they look at investment and they, they just sort of said, I, I have no idea where to go. So institutional investors, because they can devote so much time and they have so much sort of experts coming to them to educate them about things, I think they, they to me, it's no surprise they've been the first adopters. Uh, but I think the other side of the challenge too is some of the regulatory environment is because Monique, as you said, these things tend to be more complex. They tend to evolve more derivatives, which are more highly regulated. I think for, for many of the right reasons, for average person like you, you and I, you know, those product and, and type of vehicles are less available uh, to the retail market. So, you know, but, but as with many things that we didn't think would be available to an average person today, you know, 20 years ago, they're available to them today. So I think there's going to be that democratization of more complex, sophisticated product. Uh, but it's a matter of getting the right vehicle to introduce those strategies to the retail investor. Any other thoughts, Jia? Um, well, I, I, will, I will pass. I mean, maybe talk, talk to you about similar topics later. Yeah. OK. Um, and when you think about kind of how these things are available, you know, you have asset managers, quantitative asset managers like Two Sigma, Karen was up here before, who, who develop, you know, very sophisticated risk premium, factor-based quantitative strategies. And, and I don't want to speak for any one firm, but um, many of those firms, uh, you know, offer these out at, at lower fees to institutional investors. Um, but they're not necessarily transparent into what the rules are of the strategies. Um, 
I think they give a lot of information as much as an asset manager would give, but we heard on the previous panel that sometimes people are quite protective over their intellectual property and for good reason, right? Um, whereas you have other indices um, that some of the banks or others provide that are very transparent. Um, they're quantitative strategies, but they're built as an index, um, usually obtained through a derivative, a swap, a total return swap, um, mostly for institutional investors, although we do see them being wrapped in retail products more and more, um, that you sign an NDA and they give you the rules of the strategy. If you're an investor, you get the rules of the strategy. Um, I'm interested, Cleo, since since you're sort of familiar with this business, what your thoughts are on, on kind of asset managers versus bank strategies and transparency and how important that is. Yeah, I think it really depends on on people, right? Some people they want they only want to invest in things that they fully understand. Um, so and, and and maybe it's part of their job to fully understand each component of those strategies. So for, for those investors, they naturally will gravitate towards uh, the providers who are willing to offer more transparency or full transparency in, in the way you're describing. They'll actually give you the formulas that, they, they, that the strategies is managed upon. For others who I think care about what they can get out of these strategies, right, what is the the um, experience, what is the exposure they can get, they can care less about how you actually are getting it. So I think it really depends on sort of the, the preference of the end user of the strategy and I think that will be a, a factor in guiding them to either work with the banks who can who tend to be more transparent versus going to an asset manager who tend to hold things closer. Um, you know, but then it's held accountable for delivering that outcome of whatever objective they said the strategy will deliver. So a little bit of a different path. Okay. So, you know, we have a lot of trends going on here. The move to passive, um, going from kind of, you know, what used to be plain vanilla passive investments to pretty sophisticated, um, complicated passive investments, and then the role of robos, right? So a lot going on sort of in the asset management industry. And I, I'm curious about how the, the panel or your experience with kind of financial advisors, the people who are out there talking to um, investors, uh, and we might also want to say consultants, like what is their feeling? Are they embracing all of this move to passive, robo-advisors? Um, you know, what are some, some trends we're seeing from the more traditional types of advisors? You want me to go first? Yes. Okay. I would love you to go first. <laughs> so I think they're, uh, depending on where they are in terms of their business, um, but generally, I think uh, the senior management, so if you, if you look at the firm you know, that's a big national broker dealer. Senior management has recognized the trend. Okay, so you, you, you know, at the top of the house is sort of recognizing the fact that they've got to have this sort of, and they're calling it a tool, whatever you want to call it, available to clients. Um, but the individual brokers are not there yet. I think they are still sort of thinking, you know, we manage your money. We're the ones that help you navigate through the markets through your investment process and you know they feel like that's their responsibility and if they don't have um, I think their arms around the entirety of your portfolio then they feel that they're lacking so it, it comes down to human emotion again like they feel responsible for your money right so if you if you are not sharing the full uh, the full view of the way that you manage money they feel that they can't do their job efficient, efficiently. And so what we what you try to sort of say to them is what you're going to be doing is not managing the beta portion of your of a client's money. What you're going to be doing is providing them with all the advice and guidance that they need away from the passive side or from the beta side. So so for example, you're going to be providing, you know, uh, 429 plans, you're going to be helping them figure out their estate planning. You're going to be finding them, you know, uh, 
VC or PE type products, very niche type products. It's going to be a different investment process. So I, I think they will get there. They're recognizing, they're seeing the trend. Um, but I think that the individuals that I've spoken to, you know, they feel responsible and they, they feel that that's a key portion that they need to be, that they need to have their arms around, that they don't. I don't know if you're seeing anything different. No, I, I think, you know, and again, like, like everything else, there's, there's always a big distribution. But um, whenever there's something kind of new and threatening to the old way and threatening to my business, because I'm the financial advisor, right. I'm the one who's supposed to be picking the investments, it's always threatening. Um, and so I agree with Tina, like the top of the house sees this as a trend and they, they know that they have to utilize this technology in some way, shape or form. Right. Um, but, but what is the right way to utilize the technology? And, you know, I think for many, um, not just financial advisors, but all sorts of intermediaries, right? We've got broker dealers, we've got insurance companies, we've got consultants that deal with institutional investors in the U.S. Um, that they understand that the world is changing. Um, and, and not just with robo-advisors, but with passive investments. And we talked about, you know, kind of the old way in terms of fee structures. And we talked about transparency of investments and um, kind of monitoring investments. And for those that kind of recognize that the world will in fact change, um, kind of embrace these new ideas. Right. Um, and hopefully cautiously. You don't, you don't want to be, you know, all in every time, but um, I think it's important to embrace these things. It's funny, um, a, a few months back I, I was at a different event, and one of the analogies I shared with the, the, the audience there was um, about 15 years ago we started to see the first automation of um, tax return filing, so turbo tax, right? So when your tax situation is very simple, you have AW2, you're single, you don't have a house, most people I think can go through TurboTax and get a reasonably accurate tax return filed. You know, and, and as you progress in your life and your financial picture becomes more complicated, TurboTax I think or any type of automated survey right. can still be helpful, but at some point, and every person is different, right? At some point you start to, you start to say, should I have a CPA who is trained in doing this take a look just to see how close the computer, something that is like well programmed, sort of actually achieved? And then later down the road, if, if we're lucky enough, we get into a situation where we no longer feel the computer can incorporate all the complexities that we're trying to figure out, and we really just trust a, a very highly skilled human beings to do it. So I think you see segmentation market, right? Someone who has very simple investment goals, yeah. objectives, probably very well served by robo, time efficient, cost efficient, uh, sort of process efficient. But then I think there's always a spectrum. So, you know, I think that the, 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 the industry is large enough to accommodate really different offer, uh, offering levels that incorporate some kind of automation from full automation to little automation. I do have some, you know, I mean, I'm not in the financial advisory business, but uh, as a business person, um, I know this is a very exciting, uh, changing industry. So I, and, and I was just thinking, you know, I would ask myself three questions. One is, you know, how does this trend, robo advisor trend, um, affect the overall welfare of uh, asset owners? And, you know, number two, how does, how does this trend affect my business? Number three, how should I evolve my business strategy, right? And I think uh, Rover Advisors are both a threat and, and opportunities for financial advisors. You know, on the one hand, they provide much more efficient access uh, for people to be able to make investment decisions at a click of a few buttons. And so that is beneficial, the efficiency again is beneficial to not only young people and low income, lower uh, net worth investors, but also to everybody, right? To, and, and so from that perspective, there are competitors or there are threats to tradi traditional financial advisors. But then on the other hand, robo-advisor, because of their success, 
they provide some kind of a roadmap to traditional financial advisors to modernize their service platform. And they, can, they get to do that as an incumbent, right? So, so incumbent, as you know, retaining clients is easier than getting new clients. And so if traditional financial advisors can kind of learn from the new trend, they can be very successful too. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure we leave time for um, questions. I have a couple more, but are there questions from the audience? Please. I'm just curious how we're defining passive and active here. Is it a way, like when we were talking about factor investing, is it just a matter of how we package it? If we have a factor strategy, will we package it in ETF as a passive? Because we're just trying to track a factor benchmark per se. Or if we have just a fund manager who's managing the strategy, that's considered that. So I'm just curious what the line is on that. Sure. Um, I, I tend to think it's sort of vehicle agnostic. Uh, but rather is the investment decision being made in a systematic manner. So that is sort of, right, is this something that can be driven algorithm this, uh, by an algorithm, uh, whether it's in an ETF, separate account, mutual fund, really doesn't matter, or, or, you know, sort of total return swap. So I think that's sort of how I would define active versus passive. Any other, please? Uh, just go ahead, so. Yeah. Just going back to the previous panel's um, topic about how they feel that human and and um, technology would work well together, m much better together. Do you see that happening with the realm of robo advisor, especially um, if you're you're in the field? Do you, do you see that happening as well? Tina, you want to start us off? So it doesn't really work in a robo because robos are designed to have no human interaction. So. Um, you know, it's all, it's all digital. So that that's why it's so much lower cost because there's no human interaction. So the issue becomes, as Cleo said earlier, is it a portion of an overall portfolio or is it the por portfolio itself? So if it's a portion, then I think, you know, then you have the human interaction. But um, in the, its purest sense, there is no human interaction. It's an algorithm driven portfolio strategy yeah I agree with that and it's you know it's interesting because um, where we do see kind of financial advisors and intermediaries kind of embracing these tools because that's really what they are tools is as as part of their overall business so so using the the robos but then you know I think somebody on the panel said going out um, and, and using kind of more active selection for more sophisticated investments. Um, and then the, the one other thing I would add too is, you know, although the robo is rules-based and it says based on your goals and whatever, whether it's retirement or saving for education or whatever else, um, you know, it gives you sort of a formulaic, well, this much should be in equities and this much should be in bonds and this much should be in something else. Um, actually what goes into those formulas or those allocations there's a lot of research um, and thinking about kind of how to allocate assets properly uh, for different risk appetites for different goals for different time frames um, yeah that, that's fair I, I, so the investment process behind the curtain is is sort of human weighted to some degree there's an, it's an algorithm but there's it's being created by human beings the algorithm so that's true. It's the delivery is what I meant. It's 100% non, in, there's no interaction, which is why the downturn is really going to be key. Because you, you know, what, do, what are brokers really there for? They're there to hold your hands in the bad times. I mean, that's really what they do. So when things go really south, you know, you got no one to call. So it's going to be interesting to see what human nature does in that point. Other question in the back? So uh, since uh, all these uh, advising applications like Betterment and Wealthfront, since they're freely available, so uh, why don't institutional investors actually try out these applications for their rule-based or retirement date you know, plans? And then again, since they already have so many uh, asset managers coming out to them, reach out to them as well and see how their allocation is different than what these guys are proposing. 
and then probably wait it out and see which one is better. Do you think they actually do that or are they in lines of doing it? They're doing that. Oh. Yeah, Betterment's on some platforms. Right, but are institutional investors, because the, uh, for asset managers, institutional investors are um, the clients that they generally go to, right? But uh, the robo advising is, as you mentioned, starting out with low income people who uh, are planning for savings and all, right? But since institutional investors can also try it out, right? Do you think they also uh, try these out and then probably not decide to go to the asset manager instead stick to Wealthfront or things like that? I, I think that they're buying uh, quantitative strategies through people like Ria and through other, I mean, so it's readily available institutionally, right? So you're not recreating the wheel institutionally. That's already kind of been out there. Where you're really recreating the wheel is for individual investors, I think. I mean, I don't know if any of you guys disagree. Yeah, yeah, if I understood the question, um, it's, it was a little bit hard to hear you. So if I, I heard the question is, why uh, are institutional investors adopting these sort of robo financial advice into the way they manage their assets? Right. Is that the question? Why aren't they? I mean, uh, since oh, they can also- Why aren't uh, they? But they kind of are. Well, I think to some degree they are. So when you look at a typical institutional portfolio, there's usually a, a represented portion that's managed by systematic investment strategies. Right. So things like what Jaws what firm Jaws. and part of my firm does. So if you're thinking about sort of systematic investment strategies, I think those are well represented within a portfolio. I think when it comes to sort of asset allocation, which is part of what the robo-advisor does, that becomes a much more complicated strategy because for a lot of pension funds, you've got to factor into sort of funding ratio, uh, demographic of your sort of um, the, 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 the people in your pension plan. And, you know, one, the other thing I, I, I think people over, overlook is someone has to go speak to the board of their directors <laughs> and explain yeah. why these are decisions being made. And it's harder to put a robot in front in that situation than than putting human beings so you know just i think you know we could get there maybe some more you know sort of more forward-thinking boards may want to try it out you know let robo manage a small portion of your portfolio and see how it works but i think there's a lot of that human interaction that still yeah. there's a lot of perceived and, and value I, and like i said I, I don't think so the robo to me is you know when you have a passive asset allocation model it the the suggestion is that you know, but institutions aren't using passive investments already, and I think they are. They've been using them for years. The question is, you, you couldn't as an individual, unless you created your own portfolio, um, you know, or you had to buy it through your broker, which was more expensive, you couldn't do it before. So that's the difference. I think they always had access. They could always do it, and they do. Right. Question? So uh, this is just out of curiosity. So I was wondering. Um, I don't think the mic, the mic is oh, on. Because I can't hear you. Yeah. Oh, OK. Oh, OK. So you need to speak up. Okay. Yeah. Oh, OK. So uh, <laughs> wow. Um, I was wondering, like, for the robo advisor, do you guys see a lot of like vertical integration within the industry? Because if I think about your core base, it's like those uh, millenniums that are like previously unreachable. Uh, single has a, like one W two and very simple tax situation. So I was wondering, um, like, in terms of like the future development of the industry, do you guys see like kind of combine financial advisory, uh, robo-advisory with tax planning, tax reporting, and then maybe some e even some like legal uh, advice on that front? Well, I think you're definitely going to see integration in retirement. So, um, you know, I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of opportunity in helping um, investments related to IRAs and 401ks, etc. Um, so I think that's it. the easy, the easy first step is going to be retirement money. Um, I think that you know it eventually will, I think, be available on, on more platforms. But if you, as you talk to different firms, especially 
as they're sort of evaluating the future, they recognize that this is a, a tool that they need to be uh, investing in or looking in. You've seen a lot of firms uh, buy robo advisors because they, you know, they want they don't want to go build the technology. They want to build. They want to use what's already there. So I, that's what I. I mean, I think that's the first step. Okay, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I think a robo advisor, as you recognize the trend that, you know, the millenniums are getting to be an important uh, clientele, right? And so those those group of people who grow up with smartphones and internet, et cetera, and they're very comfortable making decisions and click on buttons, et cetera. So, so I think the the whole client relationship would change. And, and I think I'm not surprised at all, you know, asset management industry, financial advisory industry, noticing the trend and, you know, the success of robo advisor would pretty, uh, you know, uh, suggest that the, the industry is going this way and, and, and this is certain advantages that we, we certainly need to, certain service, uh, uh, characteristic of service that we certainly need to provide to our clients. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty key that, um, you know, that that generation of people, I can't say because I'm older, <laughs> that generation of people, you know, they don't really want to talk to anybody. So, you know, I mean, it, it's like, they don't. They want to get on the phone and do what they need to do and then Try. just go move on. So, I mean, as I think about it, I mean, it seems like a perfect solution, you know, it's, the, it's right there for you. It's not, you don't have to call a broker and, you know, feel like and you're go the to their office, office and click that's, off that's with not, them or whatever. That's just not going to happen yeah. in this generation. So yeah. I kind of feel like it's the perfect tool for yeah. this generation. Yeah. So can you maybe just repeat the question. Um, what do you think are the... What do you think are the job opportunities for quants to go into robo-advisors and are those interesting research jobs to think about if you're looking for an entry-level quant position? Absolutely. Yes, I, I made the mistake of going to the psychology building <laughs> right across here. I think one of the areas I am most personally most interested in and I think is underexplored is the human behavior. Right? How do we marry what we know to be human biases with your um, algorithm that can either try to correct human biases that we view are negative and in some sense work to accommodate human biases because we are just not going to wake up one day and think differently. So I think that is a very, very interesting area. And I think the other area that I think, you know, where we're early on is the identity, and this sort of hinges from the last panel, I think regime identification is really interesting, right? The, 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 the last panel, I think, Tanya, you talked about hurricane prediction. I think you know Pete, there there is people who are focused on researching market regimes, and you know what are the turning points, what are the data points that matter, what are the what are noise. So I think those are areas that I think you know very much uh, could be you know very relevant for the industry going forward. Yeah, and I, I don't think we're too far away because the next version of my Rolo is going to have AI mm -hmm. as part of the process. So you know it's already. They're building it already in um, the Bay Area. Uh, they're building, they're integrating the, the, the questionnaire, the risk questionnaire um, with AI technology so that we can predict uh, the outcome and the answers. So I think it's gonna be interesting. Uh, but definitely, uh, we were talking about this. I mean, I think there's gonna be a huge opportunity. This is just the beginning of this industry. I mean, this tool, I don't know what we want to call it, but because it's going to be, in my view, it's a tool for the industry, but we're just in the early days. I mean, if you think about it, it's it's a drop in the bucket in terms of assets under management because people are uncertain how to use it really in the big scheme of things. I mean, at Merrill, we had a, you know, a trillion dollars of client money. They, they haven't really embraced it yet, but, but they know they have to. And so when you recognize that some portion of that, even if it's a small portion, it's going to be huge. So I think it's just the beginning. I would definitely think that it's going to be one of the reasons I wanted to do this is I think it's a huge opportunity for all of you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, panel. Thank you.